I'm gonna love you. Hey, welcome back to Dance Chess Lounge, everyone. Today I'm gonna go over Hikaru Nakamura's round four game against Swedish Grandmaster Nils Grandelius. It was pure magic on the board. Hikaru Nakamura is a supreme tactician. His calculation skills are incredible. I was so impressed and so amazed by his game today. I mean, it was one of those positions where I would have been scared to death to play, but he was just calm, cool, collected. Uh, if you saw the, the video, he knew exactly what was going on the whole entire time. Uh, it was very impressive. His game today was very impressive. So let's go ahead and dive in and see what transpired in the game. Naka was white. He played e4, c5. So you, we're going to have a Sicilian defense. Now you have knight f3, d6, d4, c takes d, and then knight takes. So now we have the start of an open Sicilian. Uh, you know, black's going to play on a semi-open uh, c file. And then white usually plays on the king side. White has more space. But black has a very solid position that's usually hard to crack. Knight f6 hits the pawn on e4. Knight develops to protect it. And now we're going to have a Nidorf. a6 is the start of the Nidorf defense. Uh, it puts a hold over that b5 square to keep the knights and the bishop from coming to the b5 square. But black still has a lot of flexibility as well. Bishop e3, this is the English attack. e6 was the move that was played in the game. Uh, sometimes players go with e5 instead. Excuse me. Sometimes players go with e5 instead. Uh, it just gives black a more concrete position, though. So it's a little bit easier for white to... Uh, playing his attack whereas when black plays e6 it's still more flexibility because black can still play d5 or e5 so it's just a little bit more wiggle room for for black more flexibility for black f3 was played in the game b5 pushing on the queen side getting ready to hit the knight on c3 Queen d2, signaling that white is going to castle queen side. b4 hits the knight. The knight goes to a4. Usually they say a knight on the rim is dim, but uh, that was probably the best place for the knight to go. Knight d7, queen side castle, queen a5. Black is getting very active here. B3, which protects the knight on A4. And I just wanted to highlight some squares here and, and say that white is a little weak on his, his new king side. Um, but black has to be able to exploit that. Right now, the knight on A4 is blocking uh, all of black's pieces. So black can't really infiltrate just yet. But he is a little bit weaker, especially with the B3 move there. He's weak on the dark squares. Bishop B7. A3 is an interesting move here that, that wins a pawn, really. Because the queen is pinned. It's undefended. So, Nils plays queen C7. If, let's just see what happens if he would have played uh, d5 to protect the pawn uh, and to, to support the pawn even more with the bishop. If he would have played that, you would have had e5 pawn push that hits the knight on f6. So then the knight captures, knight takes e, but then you have this stunning move here. Knight takes pawn on e6, right? Pawn captures knight, but then you have this ridiculous move here. Bishop 
b6, which actually traps the queen. The queen has no good squares to go to, and uh, the queen would just have to take one of the pieces. So that would be losing right away. So instead, in the game, he plays queen c7. And then white goes ahead and takes that extra pawn on b4. D5. Now he can play D5 because his queen is is in a better position here. And then Hikaru plays bishop to F2. And I was wondering what this position was for here. But eventually Hikaru wants to reroute his, his bishop to G3 and put it on a more active diagonal there. I was wondering in this game what's going on as far as strategies because usually white plays for his attack on the king side, especially if he castles queen side, but that doesn't really happen like as in a traditional sense in this game. You guys see this this game here is just kind of just super tactical right in front of the Hikaru's Hikaru's king side. I mean, you know, I'm I'm so used to in these type of positions where the pawns are thrust forward like this you know and then there's a big attack on the on the king side but that did not happen in this game here so going on continuing with what happened what transpired you have bishop to d6 pawn takes knight takes bishop goes to g3 and now rook c8 now the engine gives a slight advantage for white at this point here but like I was saying, this position seems very scary to me. And just as a as a normal average player, I mean, if I would have this position in a tournament game, I would think I'm losing horribly <laughs> because you have Black has the battery along the C file here. He has both bishops, knights on the board, all on the queen side where, where my king is at. I mean, I, my pawn structure over there is not uh, the greatest. I'm weak on the dark squares over there. I have doubled pawns on the B file. I mean, so I and then I don't have any attack going on myself on the on the king side. So I was I would be terrified to play this position, but um, this is slightly better according to the engine. And obviously, Naka was able to evaluate this position beautifully. And he realized that he was in a better position. So he plays c4. As if the position was not already crazy enough. He plays c4. Just totally just fearless. And doesn't care that, that you know the pawns are usually used to cover the king. He's like hey man. I'm, I'm, I'm just playing all out no fear. Bishop takes pawn on b4. Queen g5 attacks the pawn on g7. Queen a5. Queen captures on g7, which also hits the rook here in the corner. So then the rook goes to f8. So he's protected. Now the knight drops back. And don't forget this pawn here is attacking this knight the whole time here. So the knight drops back to c2. But it just to go back, if that pawn did ever capture, now that would be horrible. Uh, just because white's king would be super exposed at that point. Sure, he would win material, but he would have hardly any cover at all. Now you have bishop c6. Bishop c6 is played to try to remove the knight on a4. Because the knight is kind of like the glue. It's kind of holding black back. It's like a barrier. So black can't really infiltrate quite yet. Uh, because he's, white is still kind of putting up a front here with the knight. With, the, with the, the knight. And these two pawns here. As defenses. Queen comes back to a1. Uh, to protect and to support the the knight here for when bishop captures knight or if bishop captures knight then the queen can be here to to help out knight c5 knight takes knight queen takes knight takes 
Bishop a3 check. King goes to d2. Bishop b4 check. King goes up to d3. Now in this position here, Nils plays knight c3 with the intentions of playing rook d8 and then winning, ultimately winning the rook, um, the exchange on d1. That's a very critical decision to make here. Instead of doing that, he didn't have to do that. He could have taken the knight here and got his material back. He could have taken the knight on c5, got his material back, and then continued on with the game. It would have just been a, a, a standard game here. But instead, he went for this exchange on d1. So a curl takes the, the other pawn on a6. Now you have your rook d8 check. King moves up the way, and then the rook takes. Knight takes bishop on b4, and then rook takes knight on a1, and then the king takes. So at the end of all this, white has these two monster passers, these pass pawns on the b and c file, and then he also has an extra piece as well. So, Black didn't make the right decision in that calculation, and that variation there. But, just to say, to give Neil some, some credit, though, and not to be too hard on him, that was a, an extremely difficult position to play. Extremely complicated, extremely tactical. There were so many places to go wrong. So, he, he did what he felt was the best decision at the time. King d7. Knight c2, knight b1. Now you have knight e1, which shields, it kind of shields the bishop and the rook there. So now because uh, white couldn't get his bishop out without the rook taking it. So that shields them from attack. So now white can get his bishop out. And there it is, bishop d3, rook c1. King d2, rook a1, bishop goes to e5 to attack the, the rook on a1, and to get into a better diagonal, a more active diagonal, rook d1. You know it's almost over when you have to just resort to just checks every, every move. King e2, rook c1, and that was a critical mistake because now you have Bishop b2 is traps the rook on c1. The rook's out of square, so he, so the rook is going to drop another. Um, black is going to drop another exchange here. So he just goes ahead and resigns at this point. Uh, he's he's just down too much material because you, white also has those two monster passers on b3 and c4. So that was a really good game by Hikaru Nakamura. I was really impressed with that game. I'm actually going to go over this game uh, multiple times before the end of this tournament just because this is such a great game to learn from. There's so many different intricacies that you can pick up in this game as far as a tactical standpoint. There's a lot of traps in this game here that Nils didn't fall for, but he could have fallen for and vice versa as well. So that was a good, great game. Uh, let's see who else. Aronian drew today in his game. So he's going to be out of the running. But Carl has four points, and he's in clear first. He's a half point better than, than everyone else. Um, MVL won his game today, so he's just a half point back. But Hikaru is uh, four points. He's, he's marching closer to winning the fourth straight. Gibraltar Masters. So stay tuned for the next round. And uh, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Until next time.